Father in heaven, thank you for what you for what we just sang. And these are words right out of Romans 6. Thanks be to God that though we were slaves of sin, we became obedient from the heart to teaching that we were delivered over to. And Father, what we know is that this did not come about because we were smart and we were clever and we were capable. But this slavery transition that took place was all by your grace towards us. How good and how kind you are. Lord, would you deepen our understanding of this this morning? Use our time in your word um, to draw out of us greater thankfulness to you. May this be a, a prayerful, worshipful time with our Bibles open. Not just getting facts, but meeting with you, the one who is revealed in these words. So, Father, we draw near to you and we humble ourselves under your word that you might speak over us with power and authority. Our desire is for us to be changed through what we know. Be gracious to us in this way, Lord. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Romans chapter 6 is where we are. We'll be in verse 17. I'm going to read verses 14 to 19 to kind of set the stage, and then we'll jump in here. Romans chapter 6, verse 14. You can follow along as I read. For sin shall not be master over you. Paul is saying this to the believers in the church in Rome. And here is the explanation why. For you are not under law. You're not under law as a power. But you are under grace as a power. What then? Shall we sin because we're not under law but under grace? May it never be. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness? But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, resulting in and sanctification. Whenever there is a change in power, the opposition to the new power is to be expected. Some in opposition to the new power, they express their opposition with the use of ultimate language. Uh, and we see this in our own political landscape today. Those who are in opposition to the president often refer to themselves or they are referred to as Never Trumpers, right? And whenever there's a change in power, opposition to the new power often tries to discredit, even slander the new power. This is nothing new. It happens every time there is a change in power. And this phenomenon happens most severely where there has been a change in power in the life of the one who believes Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 5 and 6 make it very clear that there has been a change of power in those who believe in Jesus Christ for salvation. Sin used to be the reigning power over that sinner. But now the reigning power over the life of that one who believes Jesus is the grace of God. You can look back at Romans chapter 5, verse 20. The law came in so that transgression would increase, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that, watch this, as sin reigned in death, even so grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
And whenever there is a change in power, opposition to the new power is to be expected. As Paul preached this reign of grace in the gospel message across the Roman Empire after three missionary journeys as he is writing this in AD 56, he experienced over and over the strong opposition to this new power that is reigning in the life of a believer. And some of them express their opposition to this grace strongly. We might call them never gracers. No matter what Paul says, no matter how thorough his explanation is of the reigning power of grace in both salvation and in sanctification, they will never, they will never accept grace as a legitimate power or a legitimate force against sin. In fact, they try to discredit grace and slander it even at every chance they get. And so Romans 6 is the gospel's defense of grace against the slanderings of the never-gracers. And there are two slanderous charges that are being refuted in this chapter, two defenses that are being given. Now, why are they never-gracers? Because they're impressed with something else, wrongly so. They are confident in something, that they've been deceived by the supposed power of another force. Another power. It's the force of law as a power. Where sinning is going on in the lifestyle of the unbeliever, they believe the best force or power against that sinning lifestyle that will end that sinning lifestyle is not grace. Because grace just simply comes to that one who's in a sinning lifestyle and just says, believe only. <clears throat> believe in Jesus and you will be declared righteous with a righteous status from God. To them, salvation by grace alone through faith alone in Jesus alone is powerless. They are not impressed with grace, but with the power of law against a sinning lifestyle. In fact, from their warped perspective, grace even sounds like it's in some kind of a mutually benefiting relationship with sin, because wherever the sin is going on and increasing, grace abounds, Paul says, chapter 5, verse 20. That's where grace comes in and abounds with faith and righteousness of God that comes through faith, but but in their mind, in contrast, law as a force, it comes into the sinning lifestyle and it makes a big old fist and it just punches right in the nose and says, thou shalt not. They believe a sinning lifestyle can actually be beat back with the brute force of law as a power. And so the never-gracers seek to discredit grace, to slander grace. Romans chapter 6, verse 1, Paul's question reveals the slander. What shall we say then? Are we to continually go on sinning so that grace may increase? That's what the slander was. You're just going to tell people to keep continuing on in sin because then grace will increase. Isn't that what you just said, Paul? That's the first slandering of grace in this chapter by the never gracers. Paul's response, verse 2, may it never be. The strongest repudiation he could say. How shall we who died to sin? Don't you know that we've died to sin? Our relationship to sin has been fundamentally altered by death to it. How shall we who died to it still continually go on living in it? Here's how we stated the gospel's first defense of grace. Do you remember this? This is review. Gospel defense number one is found in verses one to 14, and it is stated this way. Grace in no way is in partnership with sin in the believer's life. Grace is opposed to sin, not in partnership with it. And these never-gracers also believe that grace as a power is also weak in sanctification's fight against sin here and sin there as it comes up in the Christian life. Verse 15, 
If sin comes up here, then there, being under the reign of grace will be useless against that sin, they would say. But according to their foolish notion, law as a power is effective against sin in this way too. To be under law as a power, verses 14 and 15, pushes sin back and down. Here and then there in the Christian life whenever it comes up. It is an unrivaled force in their minds. In their warped, never grace thinking, Law as a power rivals grace's power against sin. Here, sin there in sanctification. Look at verse 15. Paul's question again reveals the slander or the discrediting that's going on. What then? Shall we sin because we're not under law but under grace? The discrediting that's going on is, look, if you're not under law, you're just, when sin comes here or there, you're just going to keep sinning. Why would you want to be under grace when under law is the way to go? That's the discrediting that's going on. Paul's answer, verse 15, again, may it never be. And so here's how we stated the gospel's second defense of grace that takes place in verses 15 to 23. Gospel defense, number two, grace in no way is rivaled by law in the fight against sin in the believer's life. And so what follows in verses 16 to 23 is Paul's explanation for how grace as a power is not rivaled by law as a power in the believer's fight against sin and sanctification. We began this section last time together, so I want to review point number one from two weeks ago. And then we'll take up one more point today. Grace is unrivaled power against sin in the believer, number one, by review, contrasts and clarifies the only two slave categories possible. Verse 16, do you not know that when you're, you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves, for, um, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or a slave of obedience resulting in righteousness? Verse 16 tells you and me that we are slaves with a master, every single one of us. We are very willing slaves. We actually present ourselves to a master because we have obedience to offer and we present ourselves to a master for obedience. And there are only two categories of slavery possible for us. Verse 16, we are either slaves of sin resulting in death or we are slaves of obedience to God, resulting in righteousness. These two categories of slaves were described in Romans chapter 5, verse 12 to the end of that chapter. Those in Romans 5 who are in a solidarity with each other, in sin, with Adam, the, the illustration we use is like they are, they are pebbles cemented together in a concrete slab. That's the one group. These are the slaves of sin resulting in death, verse 16. And Paul says that in chapter 5, verse 21. Sin reigns there in that solidarity with each other in Adam. Sin reigns in death. The other group in Romans 5, they are in solidarity with each other in Jesus in righteousness. They've been jackhammered out of that concrete slab, and they have been put into a new solidarity. They've been cemented into a new union with Christ and all of his believers in righteousness. It begins with a declared righteousness that is God's status of righteousness, a righteousness that comes through faith alone. Verse 21 Grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. These are now the slaves, chapter 6, verse 16, slaves of obedience resulting in righteousness. And this righteousness in chapter 6, verse 16, is the practice of righteousness that goes on in the life of the believer as a result of obedience. And the whole point being made 
The whole point being made is that this change of slavery, there's only two categories. You, you go from one to the other. There's no um, staging area between the one to the other. There's no neutral platform. You go from one to the other, and the whole point is that transition does not come about under the power of law, but under the power of grace. Grace in no way rival, is, is rivaled by law as a power because law as a power can do nothing to end our slavery to sin. In fact, chapter 5, verse 20, law came in so that transgression would increase. All it does, all law does has a power. Give laws a power to an unbeliever, to a slave of sin, and all that's going to happen is the bond with sin in death is just going to get tighter. And you want to trust in laws a power to fight against this sin here and that sin there? Grace, as a power, is an unrivaled power to trust in for sanctification. In your fight against this sin and against that sin there, believer. Why? Because it alone is the unrivaled power that ended your slavery to sin and established your new slavery to obedience to God. Grace as an unrivaled power against sin in the believer, it contrasts and it clarifies these two categories. It achieves these two categories. What is the only difference? What is the only difference between the slave of sin and the slave of obedience to God? Grace. That's it. That's the only difference. It is all of the difference. Why would we as believers in our fight against sin listen to anybody who would want us to employ law as a power against sin here and there when grace is as powerful as it is and law is as weak as it is against sin? That's review from two weeks ago. Secondly, today, grace is unrivaled power against sin in the believer creates thankfulness to God. It creates thankfulness to God for my new slavery. Verse 17. But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. Paul in thinking about what grace in its power has achieved, he has an outburst of thanksgiving, of thankfulness to God. And what I want to do this morning is I want to take some time and think about this thankfulness that has burst onto the scene where grace's power is reigning. Let's think through some characteristics of this thankfulness that are in verse 16 and that go beyond verse 16 into other texts around and we'll come back to verse 16 later. But first of all, this thankfulness is entirely centered on God. But thanks be to God. It's God-centered thankfulness. In this thankfulness, the believer is not thankful for what the believer has been able to achieve against this sin here or that sin there. In this thankfulness, the believer is not first and foremost mindful of how even another Christian has helped him or her in her fight against sin or his fight against sin. In this thankfulness, the believer is not primarily even thinking of the whole church. Paul's not thinking of the whole church at this point and how the church is an important tool in sanctification. All of those things are indeed to, we should be thankful for. But what Paul is stunned by right now in this context is that God in his grace did all of this. God is the fuel for this thankfulness. God is the focus of this thankfulness. A truly happy, amazing change has taken place because of God in his grace. This thankfulness rests on the complete and radical break from the old slavery and the beginning of a new slavery that God in his grace has achieved for the believer in Jesus Christ. 
So first, this thankfulness is entirely centered on God. Secondly, this God-centered thankfulness is shocked. Is shocked by the terrible starting place where God's saving work had to begin. This God-centered thankfulness is shocked by the terrible starting place where God's saving work had to begin. Verse 17, thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you were being slaves of sin. The, the tense here in the verb is that it was, it was a continual, never-ending existence of slaving to sin in the past. We weren't part-time slaves. We were not slaving Monday to Friday, but boy, on the weekends, we were our own man. We were sinning slaves. We were sinning like slaves over and over and over all the time. Now, in contrast for just a moment, think about where God had to start when he created everything out of nothing compared to where he has to start with you as a slave to sin. God in his triune perfection and contentment in, in his complete glory, he was the only thing that was before he created anything and everything else. And he was completely happy and content in his triune being as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. When he created, his starting point was nothing, except himself, but nothing. He didn't take something that already was outside of him and take that and expand on it and make it into all that exists. He spoke out of nothing and something came. He simply spoke and everything came into being out of that sinless nothingness. That's a pretty stunning place to begin, isn't it? That was the starting point when he fashioned the heavens and the earth and all things. But in the salvation of sinners, that is not where God had to start. When he came to you, believer, and me to fashion us into a new creation with the reigning power of his grace, he did not find us to be a sinless nothingness. We were not a sinless nothing starting point, but instead an everything sinful starting point. And sin is the great enemy of God. That's where we were. We were resisting him and every thought we had. Every thought we had towards him was hostile to God. We were plotting his death if he ever came our way. We were resisting him in every word we spoke. We were hateful of him in every attitude we displayed. We were hateful of him in every deed we did. We resisted him in every desire, and we even went about our relationships in a way with other people that we might resist him. Slaves of sin, God's starting place with us for salvation was only a God-hating place, a place very hostile to him. That's quite a different place for God, the Redeemer, to work from compared to where God, the Creator, had to start from to create everything. And we weren't just flirting with sin, you know, on the weekends. We weren't just toying with it in the evenings. We weren't test driving sin once in a while when people weren't watching. No, we were slaving continually in all that was hostile toward God and under sin 24-7. That is an even more tragic and wicked place to begin for God in his grace to work from. It would appear from our limited perspective how much greater that challenge must be for God to recreate there from that wicked, despicable, sinful place compared to where he started with a sinless nothingness. This thankfulness that is centered on God is shocked. 
by the terrible starting place we were where God's saving work had to begin, that, that he would have to, with the power of his grace, descend down into the slave pit of sin where we are slaving, that he would have to go there. A holy God would have to go there. It's a God-centered thankfulness that is shocked. Thirdly, this God-centered thankfulness is stunned is stunned that God overcame his own righteous penalty against us. A holy creator, a holy redeemer, could only have one response to the slave in that slave pit of sin, plotting God's death there. Only one response. They're down there, we're down there, we were their believer, we were slaving in such a way, we were hostile in every way toward him, and his only response as a holy God to that would be to erect a righteous wall of separation, separating himself and all of his holiness away from what is going on in that pit, and then he would then cast out a penalty on the offenders there. The offender there must pay with his life. His spiritual life, not just his physical life, his spiritual life, the payment of that righteous penalty will be away from God forever, and it is a payment that outlasts this mortal body. In fact, we will be raised up with a, an immortal body that will be able to endure and pay forever the penalty in hell. And this is what this God-centered thankfulness is mindful of. If we are to be saved there, not only does God have to start in a wicked and tragic place of slavery to sin, but God must somehow deal with his own righteous separation that he has made from slaves to sin, and he must figure out a way to deal with their forever payment of the penalty against them that they deserve. He has to overcome that. How does he satisfy his own righteous anger against them so as to save them? How does he get over his own separation from them? It feels like it would have been easier just to speak out of nothing and something come into play. Fourthly, this God-centered thankfulness is humbled. This God-centered thankfulness is humbled by God's costly price and method for saving us. This God-centered thankfulness is humbled by God's costly price and method for saving us. God alone is the one who can and who must overcome his own righteous separation and righteous penalty against us. But to do so, God had to take on our flesh, yet without the sin of the flesh. God had to become man to do so. The Son of God agreed and did. He took on flesh, yet without the sin, so that he might become the innocent substitute who would suffer in our place under the righteous separation from God and he would bear the righteous penalty of God that we earned. This was God's method. He did not turn to you in the pit. He did not turn to me in the pit and say, come up with a method to resolve this. Because all we would have done is we would have grabbed law as a power and made a mess of things. Even worse. He turned to himself in his son instead and he secured the method of salvation through the costly price of his son's own life and blood at the cross. This was the only way for God's righteous separation from us to be overcome by satisfying it, by satisfying it, 
God the Father turned his back on God the Son at the cross. He separated himself from his Son as if his Son was the one slaving in sin, not us. God overcame his righteous separation by satisfying it on the cross as his son cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And this was the only way for God's righteous penalty to be overcome by being paid. God the son paid the penalty with his life and blood at the cross. He died and he took the penalty that you and I could never pay. He was innocent. He was not worthy of a penalty. But as our sinless substitute, sinful slaves get their penalty paid as he suffered under it. You see, this God-centered thankfulness is humbled by that. It's humbled by God's costly price and method for saving us. Fifthly, this God-centered thankfulness rejoices. Rejoices. This God-centered thankfulness rejoices over God's free offer in grace. For that righteous satisfaction of the separation and the payment of the penalty, God does not charge you for it. He doesn't charge me for it. He does not turn to you and to me and say, you know, get to work and merit this salvation to activate this saving achievement of my son on your behalf. Rather, God simply... God simply comes with his grace into the, the pit of slavery to sin. And he says, I will start from this tragic and wicked place where you are a slave of sin. My son endured the righteous separation from me you deserve. My son paid the righteous separation penalty from me that you deserve. I ask, that's what he says to the sinner, I ask nothing of you in payment, but by my grace in this pit where you are, I bring you a gift that you do not deserve. Faith in my son. Believe my son with this faith that I give you by grace alone. That faith that the slave of sin exercises in the bottom of that pit is not a work that that slave of sin mustered up. All that slave of sin can do, as we saw in Romans 1, is only hate God and try to kill God. Not believe him. It is not a work that the slave musters up that saves him. If we are to be saved by grace alone, through faith alone, apart from works, the only way the faith we express cannot be a work of our own is if it is a gift that he gives to the slave of sin. Go back to chapter 3, verse 20. Let me just show you how faith and grace and works are mutually exclusive categories. Chapter 3, verse 20. By works of law, no flesh will be declared righteous. Works will not get you to the declared righteousness you must have. Look at verse 28. We maintain that a man is justified, declared righteous by faith, what? Apart from works of law. Where faith is, it is not a work. Do you understand that? Chapter 4, verse 5. But to the one who does not work, but in contrast to that, what? Believes. Believes in him who justifies the ungodly. His faith is credited as righteousness. Righteousness. 
You see, this is what this God-centered thankfulness marvels at and rejoices at. The free offer of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. God does not come down into the pit of our slavery to sin. He does not say, you know, endure my separation and pay the penalty, let's say, for a million years, and then we can have a conversation. He doesn't do that. Rather, he just says, in the midst of your slaving to sin, I bring you, by my grace, faith. Believe, my son, with this gift of faith. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And what? 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 That is not of yourselves, but is the gift of God. This God-centered thankfulness rejoices over God's free offer in grace. And lastly, sixthly, this God-centered thankfulness is impressed. This God-centered thankfulness is impressed by the extent of God's transforming grace. Just how far grace transformed us is impressive. And this is the primary focus back in Romans chapter 6. God didn't just take you, believer, and transform you from the pit of slavery of sin. He didn't take you there from your monstrous, wicked slavery of sin and take you to the ground level of some kind of neutralness. God's transforming, transforming grace took you, from, uh, took you much farther than from evil to neutral. That's a fictional place, by the way. God's transforming grace instead brought you from slaving hard for sin down in that pit of slavery to, verse 17, wholehearted obedience to God. But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. As vigorously evil you were in your slaving to sin, grace transformed you to this extent that you became heart engaged in obedience to God. The word heart in scripture often means your inward self. Your inward self. It's who you are entirely, inwardly, before God. The extent of God's transforming grace should be thought of this way. It's not a piece of you that has become obedient to a new teaching, but it is all of who you are inwardly before God that has become obedient. Listen, down in the slave pit of sin, there was nothing superficial about your slaving to sin there. And there is nothing superficial about the obedience you express to new teaching by grace's transforming work and power. You become obedient from the heart, who you are inwardly. Your obedience to this new teaching that has come is not, it's not like a, a robe that you wrapped around yourself externally, but in contrast, it is a deeply internal obedience that wells up within you. It is an obedience that has seized all of who you are inwardly, internally, before God. This God-centered thankfulness is impressed that God transformed us by his grace to that extent. Let there be no doubt in your mind about the work and the achievement of grace on your part. It will take you as far as God intended grace to take you, which is obedience from the heart. So what a horrible starting place God had to begin his work of grace in. 
And what a huge righteous separation and penalty he had himself to overcome. And only he could overcome it in his son by the costly sacrifice of himself. And how amazing that he freely offers to us by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, this salvation. And what an extensive transformation his grace has achieved within for slaves, from being slaves to sin all the way to heart-generated obedience. You see, grace, number two, (laughs) creates thankfulness to God. For this indescribable gift of salvation and new life to live in sanctification. And his whole point is if law was the power we were to use, we're supposed to use, then all the thanks would be toward us. We would have something to boast in. But we don't boast in anything except for Christ crucified for us. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one would what? Boast. All of the thanksgiving is on God. Grace is not rivaled by law as a power. Grace transforms us into new creatures who cannot be quiet, who cannot be contained, who cannot be restrained. We need to be like Paul, who right in the middle of this just says, but thanks be to God that though we were slaves to sin, how did we get this far that we are obedient from the heart? In Paul's days, many were shocked by grace's claim. And they would have to have asked the question, do we dare displace law as a force with grace as a force? That's what they were having to wrestle through. And the answer is, yep, do it. Do it. Gladly do it. We have been transformed into thankful Obedient from the heart, slaves of God. I'm so convicted by this. When, when someone asks me, and it's even happened several times this morning, and I'm, I'm trying to start something new in my heart, in my mind. When somebody asks me, how are you? I don't say thankful very often. I should. We should. I want to learn to say thankful to God. The more we meditate on what grace has achieved in us and for us, the more we will not be able to contain thankfulness to God, but instead we'll just bubble over with it. Believer, if, if, if all you let yourself see every day, every week, are your trials and your losses and your setbacks and your discouragements and all of the injustices committed against you, what's going to come out? Grumbling, complaining. That will be what oozes out of you and me. But if instead... We take ourselves by the collar and drag ourselves back in front of the gospel and say, look here, heart. Look here, mind. Upon the achievements of God's grace in our salvation and in our sanctification too, then God-centered thankfulness will burst forth. It will. It will not be able to be suppressed. The more we meditate on what his grace has achieved in us, the more thankful we will be, even though we are in trials, experience losses, have setbacks, experience discouragement, and have injustices committed against us. 
In fact, take your biggest loss, take your, the biggest injustice committed against you, take any one of them, single it out, and measure it up to the achievement of grace within. It doesn't even compare. It doesn't overshadow your thankfulness to God. It doesn't quench your thankfulness to God. In fact, live 70 years, live 80 years, live 90 years, and add up all of the trials of life, all of the, the setbacks, all of the losses, all of the discouragements, all of the injustices committed against you, and not even all of them together in their big heaping pile can rob you if you have your mind set on this gospel. All of them together can't rob you of thankfulness to God. You can kiss a stake that you're going to burn at. <laughs> How do you explain that? Grace. The grace of God has a power. Thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. What I want to do as we finish, I want to just give you a moment where you can, in the quietness of your own heart, just pray and express thankfulness to God, and then I'll close our time in prayer in a moment. Why don't you just bow your head and pray. Whatever God is laying on your heart in regards to this, uh, if you've been a grumbler these days, now's a good time to maybe talk to the Lord about that. Let's pray, and I'll close this in a moment. Heavenly Father, I pray for my fellow believers here that you would hear their prayers. What they cry out to you even now, Lord, would you answer it in your good and perfect way and timing. Father, we pray that you would make us as a church into a thankful people, people who are far more aware of what grace has achieved than what this broken world and in our own sinful flaw deals us. Help us to set our minds on the things above where Christ is seated and not set our minds on worldly things and events that happen to us here. Lord, as we meditate more, as we discipline ourselves, as we control ourselves to come before your word and examine these kinds of things, we pray that your grace would well up within us a thankfulness that is centered on, on you. And this morning, if you know that you are not a believer in Jesus Christ, listen, God's grace if it comes today even in power and saves you with faith in Jesus, it will not end your trials in this life. It will not end your losses. It will not end setbacks, discouragements, or injustices committed against you. But what the power of grace in your life will end is your slavery to sin. And then it will put all of those other things in their proper perspective. And eventually one day when Jesus comes to reign, the trials and the losses and the setbacks and the discouragements and the injustices will be put away. If we die and go to heaven before then, they will be put away then. Unbeliever this morning, cry out for God to save you with his grace through faith alone, in Jesus alone, apart from any works. Believe Christ's work to be sufficient at the cross for you. Heavenly Father, we marvel again at your grace towards us. Increase our capacity to understand this, to absorb it, to live it, 
that we might express thankfulness to you. And it's in your son's name we pray, amen.